Well, for those of you who don't know me, I am one of the associate pastors here. My name is Tanya Torp, and I always say how long I've been coming. Many of you know I don't even know how long I've been here. Um, but I love this community so much. Um, we were just talking in the back. I was talking to somebody about their prayers and laments and the things that they're lifting, and I just talked about how polarized we are. And I'll say a little bit more about that, but how polarized we are out there. But even when we come into this space to be able to just admit that, is refreshing to be able to say it's hard. Um, and so I love this community. Uh, if you've been following along with us for the past couple of months, we are on this journey to spending a year with Jesus. And we just want to study Jesus. And personally, I've been uplifted. I have felt connected to those who have come before us for generations and generations. And I've also been pretty convicted. <laughs> Um, and the things that God is calling me to do and the ways that God is calling us to walk. And I've done a lot of looking at myself and at my own responses and seeking wisdom from the Holy Spirit to guide me and to change me. I want to be changed. And if you missed any of them, I would challenge you to go uh, look at our website and uh, check out those messages and catch up to us because it's been really incredible. We're going to start in Luke. We're going to talk about um, a parable that is pretty famous of the Good Samaritan this morning, and we're going to read in Luke. You'll see it on the screen. I've got mine here. Some of you have your Bibles, so I'll give you a moment to get to it. Luke 10, verse 25 through 37. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he encountered robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came up upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed compassion upon him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. And you don't have to be a churchgoer or somebody who's been in the church to understand the connotations of Good Samaritan. We have Good Samaritan Hospital right down the street from us. We um, hear this in our cultural lexicon when you hear about somebody who is being just a Good Samaritan. And we also have laws, even along Kentucky, on being a Good Samaritan. If you are helping somebody out in a crisis, maybe you're giving CPR to somebody in an emergency and you might crack their rib, this law helps to protect you because you're being a Good Samaritan. But I would argue, argue that these examples pale in comparison to the original meaning and what was behind the text. So before we dive further into the story, we need a brief history of some of this context. So when, Jos when Jesus chose to make the Samaritan the hero of the story, he was being incredibly provocative. Now, you will notice when I said Samaritan and we read it together that nobody gasped, but I believe that there at the time there might have been some gasps. He was being completely provocative. Before there is history between the Samaritans and the Israelites, and let's move them into, these, into this space, there was incredible history between the Israelites and the Samaritans. And in the immortal words of Taylor Swift, it was bad blood, y'all, real bad blood. <laughs> I'm glad I got a laugh, because usually John talks about hip-hop, so I had to bring in Taylor Swift. <laughs> We're not going to turn to it right now, but in 2 Kings 17, we read about uh, this time in 7, 722 BC, where the king of Assyria captures the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria. 
In short, the people of God are wildin'. Now, some of y'all follow me on social media, and you see where I say my children are wildin'. They're four and six, so if you don't follow me, then I will translate that word wildin'. They actin' up. So the people were acting up, and God had sent all these prophets to talk to them, to try to change them, to get them to follow his, his ways and to repent, but they still insisted upon worshiping other gods and disobeying him at every single time that they could, so he finally removed his hand of protection. And the king of Assyria took nearly everyone into captivity, with the exception of the elderly and the very sick and those left to take care, for them, care of them. And it's recorded that some 28,000 Israelites were taken into captivity. That's like 10 out of the 12 tribes of Israel just gone from that space. And enemies of the Israelites resettled into the area, started intermarrying with some of the Jews that were left behind, and those families began to not only worship God, but worship some other things as well. To the Jews, this meant that they were no longer purely Jewish, and they were not part of the Jewish race anymore. And at that point, folks started wild and again. So much so that God actually sent lions at one point to walk through their space and start just picking people off. It was a scene. So the king gives an order to have the Israelites bring in the priests and come back and show everybody how to worship God and to remember the ways of the Lord. But the people continue, what, y'all? Wilding. They keep wilding. Um, so they create their own places of worship. They ignore all the ways that they've been taught to worship the true God. Meanwhile, in 600 BC, Judah, the, sword, the southern kingdom fell, and Jews were exiled from their land for 70 years. And when they were allowed to return and rebuild Jerusalem, the Samaritans were vehemently against them. When some Samaritans had a change of heart and came to help rebuild Jerusalem, the Jews called them, quote, half-breeds and sent them away. The Samaritans built their own temple, which the Jews considered pagan, they, they grew this huge, huge feud, and it just continued and continued. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and it was pretty uh, both-sided. Yeah, they both hated each other. So much so that they crossed the Jordan River whenever they traveled to Samaria, which meant that they were taking an extra 50 miles out of their way. I don't know if you have ever walked 50 miles to avoid someone, but I'm not the person who's doing that. Uh, but they did. <laughs> And there's also a story about the Samaritans desecrating the Jerusalem temple by scattering bones during Passover, which was a big no-no. But as we study Jesus, we see him entering Samaria lots of times. So let's look at Luke 9, verse 51 through 56. Luke 9, 51 through 56, you'll see it on the screen. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him, and they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. I mean, calling down fire to rebuke them for not receiving you, that's a, a whole nother level. But you also might remember the first Samaritan evangelist, who was a woman, the woman at the well, when he voiced, when he talked to her and she voiced to him, like, I don't even know why you're talking to me because I'm a woman and I'm a Samaritan woman and you're still talking to me. And he told her all about her life, um, offered her that living water, and they had what would be considered a countercultural exchange. And people were saved. So this is a long, long history. And Jesus was very deliberate in what he was doing when he shared this, this story. He was turning the paradigm upside down to make them question and interrogate the law and what it's saying to them and how they live it out. I also want to share the context in which Jesus is sharing this parable. Um, and it's not going to be on the screen, but I'm going to read a quote from a scholar. The location of the parable is the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. Jerusalem was known as the city of worship and its magnificent temple, while Jericho was the residence for many who included priests and Levites. Therefore, it was expected that priests and Levites would travel regularly to Jerusalem to perform their temple duties. So this is they're going back and forth to perform these duties while they're walking on this road that we're talking about. The road was notorious for its robberies and became more dangerous when Herod left, and he laid off 40,000 construction workers from that place 
leaving plenty of unemployed people, some who turned to thievery. The distance between Jericho and Jerusalem was 17 miles, and the road cuts through desert and really rocky country, which is still a little rocky today, even with a paved road. The robbery of the lone stranger going down the road does not pose as a surprise to anyone who was hearing this story. So this is not a surprise to the people that are hearing it. Jesus knows that he is talking to an expert in Mosaic law. And when I think about this, it kind of rocks my mind when I let, let it kind of seep in. So here is somebody who is a human interpreting the word of God, who is the word of God standing in front of him. He's essentially this expert, but has not internalized this Jesus that's standing right before him. Jesus is making himself tangible and real out of love. The expert in the law is basically asking something that we might ask ourselves. How little can I do? How little can I love? What's the bare minimum? Who do I need to love in this way? And who can I not love in this way? Who can I ignore? And if we're honest with our busy days and our increasing sense of fear and dread in our society, perhaps we can find some commonalities there. Detachment, while being a person of faith, isn't abnormal. For some, this parable is one of the hard ones, and it kind of is for me too in some ways. And I'll admit that the Western church has not done a great job of staving off condemnation. Earlier I talked about conviction. There's a big difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is from Jesus, and it's leading you to expand your understanding and condemnation is from the enemy and leads you to guilt and shame and spiraling into apathy or frozen silence or even busyness just for optics. This parable has been used repeatedly to say that if you are helping everyone that comes into your path, you are not living out of your faith. For some, that has amounted to an almost robotic style of service where you're just working for the kingdom, but it's really and completely unhealthy, and you have no real time to breathe. Every moment is devoted to doing good works to prove that you're worthy of the Lord and worthy of the faith. And that's not what it is. That's not what it's about. If you are experiencing or have experienced this, um, using the parable of the Good Samaritan to make you feel guilty, I'm going to put you at ease right now because that's not this kind of sermon. That's not the message today. Faith and works are both important in our faith walk, and we've talked about that before. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, but faith without works is dead. The answer is that we need both, both of them. The answer is balance. The answer is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the most holy thing you can do is rest. Sometimes the most holy thing you can do is say no. That does not mean that we come to church once a week, pat ourselves on the back, and just go back to being the way that we were, Tangible service is a part of the Christian life, but our motivation should never be because we don't want to be condemned. So let's get back to the parable. So we're under Roman law at this time, waiting for the Messiah who's going to bring us freedom from the oppressors. Here enters Jesus, and he's walking around healing the sick, uplifting the broken and the poor and the oppressed, and anybody who's considered an outsider. He's inviting people into his mission, even women and spending time teaching, not with a sword. The religious leaders at this time are finding it very hard to understand and accept that he could be the Messiah and believing that Jesus is trying to do what he's really trying to do. So we find Jesus in this situation often. Jesus is presumably teaching at a synagogue and time is running out. We're getting closer and closer to that day when he's going to be on the cross and there is such an urgency in this time. Another important thing to note is that it is not uncommon to argue in this tradition. It's usually intense debate in the synagogue, so Jesus wouldn't have been put off by somebody asking him questions. It's expected. It's an expected part of life. So um, we're going to look at Luke 10, 25 through 37 again, if you'll just put that back up on the screen. So... Here we are, we have this dying man with whom we have very little information, and I know that that is on purpose. And then you have the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan who are all there and able to intervene, right? The first person to pass by the half-dead victim is this priest. 
Tradition says that he might have been returning after performing duties at the a temple in Jerusalem. And priests were members of the, tree, the tribe of Levi. And we don't know why the priest has to pass by on the other side of the road, but we know that he does. We also know that there are possibilities. So some think that there was a genuine fear of robbers. We talked about that already. There was genuine fear, so maybe he just kept on thinking it was a trap. Somebody was going to jump out at him if he went over to him. Might have also been concerned with purity. There was these, these rules that they couldn't touch dead bodies unless they were actually their very close family members or else they would be considered unclean. So what would that mean? In doing his duties, he would have to go stand on the eastern gate with the unclean, stand among them, and then he would have to go through a whole process of purification again, which would cost a lot of time, some wages, and he'd also have to purchase an animal to sacrifice. So maybe that was his reason for not stopping. The next person to pass by was the Levite. Again, these were the descendants of the house of Levi and were part of the priestly community. So the same thing there, being unclean, might have been a reason why um, he didn't help. And then there's the, Samar the Samaritan that we've already talked about that history. Um, and I want to reiterate, using the Samaritan character as the hero was kind of, a, on a historical note, a bombshell to the audience. So I've been reading this uh, new re released uh, First Nations ver version of the Bible, and I love how the authors refer to Jesus, creator sets free. The very idea that Jesus, the word, through which everything was created, came to set us free. Creator set free. When Jesus says, go and do the same, he is challenging the expert in the law and all of us into the future. He's looking at us and saying, love someone, love someone extravagantly. And he's also challenging us who are the followers of Jesus. He uses this enemy character to do far more for the, than the religious leaders think. Our examples of how we do it the right way to show love, to fulfill the law, are not what he's bringing up. We're never told the religion of the beaten man, but we are never told anything about where he's going, what he was doing. Would it have been different if Jesus had said this was a beaten man that was a Jew? Would, it, would he have responded differently? I think he would have. He might not have been able to touch him, but maybe he would have called some people over. We're never told um, what those circumstances are, but we do know that Creator Sets Free is attempting to show this expert in the law that he must have something in common with this hero of the story who happens to be his mortal enemy. He must break the barriers he has, he has had in his mind so that he can love like this hero character loves, which would have been so off-putting to stand there and think about that. We talk a lot about polarization, talked about that a little bit earlier in this climate, but historically, there has always been polarization. This is nothing new. However, Jesus is reaching into the present and asking us in the room, here in this room together, to interrogate our own motives for how we love and, in fact, whether or not we are showing up as his followers. He's also setting the stage for something really interesting to think about the Gentiles being grafted in. He's setting the stage with the story by saying, this Samaritan is doing the work that I want you to do. So, um, look at Deuteronomy 6. 4 through 12. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Not just on Sundays, right? Not just on Saturdays. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he would give you a land with large and beautiful cities that you did not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. You may recall that Moses stood before the Israelites and recited those Ten Commandments because they would not go up to the mountain to meet God face to face due to their fear. 
Moses was given those Ten Commandments, and the summing them up is the act toward God, a loving act of God is where we're summing them up here, and a God who needs nothing from us. God needs nothing from us. Those witnessing this would have known intently that, God is, that Jesus was hearkening back to those words. So there's a picture that should come up on the screen of a mezuzah, and there was a, this is a photo of one that looks kind of similar to one that was affixed to our door when we first moved in our house, and it contains the Ten Commandments as a reminder. Remember that part about putting it on your door? Literally keeping that at the forefront of your life and repeating it over and over again that this is what God would have of us. Here we are in this story with people who have been doing that for their lives, and yet here is Jesus standing in front of them telling them how to love and they're not quite sure they want to love in that way. Isaiah 58, which we read a little bit earlier, we'll read again. Isaiah 58, 6 through 11 says, Isn't this the fast I choose, to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the, to bring the poor and homeless into your house? to clothe the naked and when you see him and not to ignore your own flesh and blood, then, then your light will appear like the dawn and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. At that time, when you call, the Lord will answer. When you cry out, he will say, here I am. If you get rid of the yoke among you, the finger pointing and the malicious speaking, and if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted one, then your light will shine in the darkness and your night will be like noonday. The Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in the parched land and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and like a spring whose water never runs dry. Sounds like living water, right? Sounds like life eternal. So here is a Samaritan doing what the religious folks are trained to do, brought up to do, yet they have gotten comfortable and no longer bother themselves with doing the will of the Lord. It has become an inconvenience. Matthew 25, 40 says, And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for me, for one, the least of these brothers and sisters, mine, you did it for me. Romans 13, 8 through 9 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in, the same, in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And again in Galatians 5, we see it. For the whole law is fulfilled in one, in the statement, You shall love your neighbors as yourself. This man was an expert in the law and yet did not know who his neighbor was. How can that be? We know how this is, right? Like, we know personally, individually, because we do it too. When someone asks about our faith, we might boldly proclaim that we're followers of the way of Christ, but do we allow that truth to change us? Sometimes. To change how we interact with the world? Sometimes. James 2.8 says, If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So he calls it the, loyal, the royal law. Again and again and again, we've seen in all of these scriptures how we're supposed to do it. But it takes community to remind us. It takes the Holy Spirit to guide us. And it takes our willingness to see that even our enemies who believe differently than us can love deeply. How can we love completely? How can we walk it out? Oscar Romero said, It is very easy to be servants of the world without disturbing the world. A very spiritualized word, spiritualized word a word without any commitment to history. A word that can sound in any part of the world because it belongs to no part of the world. world. A word like that creates no problems, starts no conflicts. <sighs> what starts conflicts and persecutions? What marks the genuine church is the word that burning like the word of the prophet proclaims and accuses, proclaims to the people God's wonders to be believed and venerated and accuses of sin those who oppose God's reign so that they may tear that sin out of their hearts, out of their societies, out of their laws, out of their structures that oppress, that imprison, that violate the right of God and humanity. This is the hard service of the word. 
but God's spirit goes with, with the prophet, with the preacher, for he is Christ who keeps on proclaiming his reign to the people for all time. This is what we're called to do. What Jesus is asking of this man is to be subversive, to be countercultural, to recognize his neighbor as everyone, to expand his own borders. He has been spiritualized into thinking he is the elite enough to be with God, yet the most simplistic truth is something that he's missing. So, what are you missing in your life? Where are you playing it safe? Are you doing good works that you're comfortable with? Or are you one of the people that would be the priest, the Levite? Or maybe you're the Samaritan, laying on the ground, hurting, broken, and waiting for someone to come and speak into your life. Are there places where we seek justice and mercy? Mercy over justice? Mercy for others? Over what we believe? Or what I believe I deserve? Are there places that my obedience to him looks less like public good and more like genuine love? There's this saying, mercy over justice, obedience over sacrifice. And arguably his most famous work, Jesus and the Disinherited, Howard Thurman says this. It was long after a matter of serious moment that for decades we have studied the various peoples of the world and those who live as our neighbors as objects of missionary endeavor and enterprise without being at all willing to treat them either as brothers or as human beings. For me, some of the scariest words in the Bible are in 1 Samuel when he says that the Holy Spirit left Saul and he didn't even know it. It takes a lot to stay in a place of humility and learn from the Holy Spirit when to move, when not to move, how to love. But it also takes work to do the right part that often is in Scripture about loving our neighbors. Some of us don't know what that means, because as we're supposed to be loving our neighbors as ourselves, we are actually ourselves walking around with unhealed, gaping wounds. There is so much bitterness and self-loathing, so much sorrow that we do not love ourselves. Therefore, how can we love others? It takes work to cleanse from bitterness. It takes intention to submit your tender and broken heart before him. A heart that's tired of trauma a heart tired of this world that isn't our home, Jesus knew it would be hard. He knew it would be countercultural in our own cities, in our own states, in our own homes. We see examples of hospitality and care for those who encounter Jesus, and we want it. We long for it. But we also compare ourselves to those who are doing it, and it sends us into the spiral of self-loathing and stuckness. That is not the love that God wants us to have for ourselves. I'm going to invite you to enter into a space that seems more prayerful, like as we prayed earlier today. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Our idea of doing good deeds has to look different than the world, so I'm asking you, what is God inviting you into? Ask yourself, what is God inviting you into? What is he inviting those he's calling you to serve into? Remembering that it's not about us, it's about him. What is he inviting those he's calling us to serve into? Is your service contributing to the gentle rhythm of life that God is calling us to or not? Is your service part of a continuing gentle rhythm, part of your life? And the last question I'll ask is, are you willing to be led? Are you willing to be led? You can open your eyes, join us again. So on a micro level, we should be asking ourselves, how can we do this if we can't even do this to our own families? If we can't live and love like the Samaritan to our own household, to the people that we love that are around us, to families that are torn apart by all of this 
th these things that we're talking about, this polarization. If we can't love them, how are we going to love like the Good Samaritan? And on a national level, how can we support missions and sharing the gospel in other countries that we continually oppress with policies? How do we do that? The degree of impossibility is here in this parable because it is the equivalent to go and sell everything you have, right? That's what this parable is pretty much saying. Go and do it, right? It calls it costs. There's a costliness to this. In those same lectures that I talked about earlier, Howard, Howard Thurman said this. Well, actually, let me back up. He was in this space where he was talking to somebody who'd been jailed during a war, and he was jailed because he wouldn't fight. And so this is the words that he shares. While there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a cr the criminal element, I am of it. While there is a man in jail, I am not free. That is way too heavy, it feels like, for us to even think about the fact that we need to equate ourselves with others, that we are not higher than others, even with all of the things that we've been given, to remember that we are with and we are called to be with others, that they are family, that we are neighbors. I will tell you how this challenged me when I was preparing for this. It challenged me a whole lot. I don't know if, if you can bring up the two pictures. I don't know if they're together. Okay, so some of you know this story. Um, one of our partners, the Lexington Rescue Mission, um, has been trying to find space, or had been trying in my neighborhood in the East End. And um, many of you know that I work with young single moms. The youngest mom is usually around the age of 12. The oldest is around 24. And so we get to work with these moms and walk alongside them and, and love them. And what we are all experiencing right now is a really hard times with affordable housing. But as John mentioned earlier, just lots of things are really hard for people right now. And if you follow me on social media, you know I get a little spicy sometimes. And I got a little spicy about this. Um, so not just in my neighborhood, but then another neighborhood um, that's down the street as well, the Lexington Rescue Mission tried to open up a space, a space where they could love on people who are unhomed or who are experiencing really hard times. And in my particular instance in the East End, um, some of us that are activists didn't find out about it um, until the last minute, and so we showed up and made statements and gathered as many people as we could to make a statement that we wanted this in our neighborhood, that we knew that would be affecting people in our neighborhood. Um, and we heard some of the most vile and horrific things that you could think other people would say about unhomed people, about people that are our neighbors, just spewing it. People who are saying that they're Christians, standing up and saying, I don't want this in my neighborhood, and here's why. And it was pretty horrible and demeaning. Uh, things that I would never say, things that many of you would never say about your own neighbor that you wouldn't want said about anyone. And for me, I think about these young moms. They're talking about my moms. They're talking about my neighbors. They're talking about my friends. And I got pretty angry, pretty upset. And then um, the next neighborhood, uh, the Lexington Rescue Mission, was actually able to, to secure a place. And neighbors came out in droves and said even more vile things people who admitted that they served on boards for nonprofits that were serving this population but didn't want it in their neighborhood and would say just the most horrible things. And I'll admit, um, I, I'm, I got real angry <laughs> um, and wanted to you know, storm the castle and do all the things. And the Lord was just really speaking to me while I was preparing this message, how am I going to love those people who were opposed? Right? Because I don't want to, I'll be honest with you. I want to be really angry with them. I think it's despicable. I think it's inhumane. But how do I love them? What are the ways in which God is calling me to love those people? Many of you know I've been writing this book for like three years that I'm, whew, three years, um, about radical hospitality. And I got stuck. That's why the book's not out yet, because um, in my neighborhood, we talk a lot about radical hospitality, inviting people in. And um, it started happening with this gentrification, and all of my neighbors were forced out of the neighborhood, and they are nowhere to be found now. Don't know where most of them are. And they can't afford to live here anymore. And so part of the ending of the book was like, well, now the neighborhood is so different. What does radical hospitality look like? with these neighbors who have moved in. Some of them moved in to gentrify the neighborhood and some moved in not knowing the story. So how do I love them? And that's the call that I don't, I don't actually have an answer yet. 
Y'all, I'm, I'm walking this with you. I don't know how to love these folks. I don't know how to love folks who would stand up and say such horrible things about human beings in our community. But I am willing to submit myself to the Holy Spirit to figure it out. And that's where we need to be. I spoke about mercy and justice, and God brings the justice. He's asking me to bring the mercy. Creator Sets Free is calling us, us, to the kind of love that breaks down barriers and the kind of love that is so costly, the kind of love that is impossible without him. The question is, will we answer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.